Alrighty, let's uh, get started here. This is chapter 16 on uh, heat transfer. Um, basically, uh, we've talked about uh, heat and uh, and the different properties of at atoms and molecules moving uh, at higher temperature. And heat is the transfer of energy between uh, objects of a different temperature. Uh, so there's three basic ways it can it can do this: conduction, convection, and radiation. Uh, conduction occurs uh, with a hot and a cold object in direct contact with each other. So it's basically the atoms and the molecules colliding and exchanging that momentum directly. Um, so that's uh, basically what's going on here. Convection is kind of what's going on uh, in a pot of boiling water. If you've ever watched uh, macaroni uh, boil in a glass pot, you could see like uh, the water's churning, and, and we'll get into more of this in detail in a minute. Irradiation uh, basically occurs um, as uh, you know the atoms and molecules vibrating um, because uh, whenever you have a charge that's um, accelerating or decelerating, it emits uh, radiation. Uh, it loses energy by this uh, effect. So anything that has any kind of temperature at all, as long as it's not zero degrees Kelvin, is emitting some kind of radiation. And we'll get in also get into that in a little more detail. All right, uh, conduction again, just a direct contact, and and it has to do with molecular collisions. Um, conductors uh, are things that conduct uh, temperature um, very quickly. So a metal is an example of a conductor, um, a good conductor of heat. Uh, so if you if you grab a metal object that's a, a high temperature, uh, you're going to feel it right away. You get burned right away. Whereas you grab something that's uh, maybe not such a good conductor, uh, you might have to hold it for a couple seconds before you feel the effect of its temperature. A, a good example is hot rocks. You can pick up a hot rock and, and not get burned immediately. Um, but if you pick up a hot piece of metal, you know immediately that that metal is, is too hot to touch. But a rock, you might be able to hold it for a couple of seconds. Um, poor conductors, uh, things that have a lot of air pockets in them like foam or wood um, or anything that's usually a, an insulator of electricity is generally also an insulator of heat. And that's not always true. There are exceptions to this rule, but uh, in general, it's true. Um, okay, um, let's try for a question. Now, this is how I'm going to work this with the video is um, uh, you could pause the video after I read the question and pick your best answer and then unpause the video and see if you, how you did. If you hold one end of a metal bar against a piece of ice, the end of your hand will soon become cold. Does the cold flow from the ice to your hand? No, it actually, the heat flows from your hand to the ice. Remember, heat always flows in the direction of hot to cold uh, because cold is really just less heat. So that it's um, kind of a way to understand why that's true. Okay, um, so insulation doesn't prevent the flow of internal energy. It just slows it down. Um, a good example um, is walking on coals. Um, and uh, basically kind of the calluses on your feet are kind of an insulator so you can walk on coals. Um, I don't advise it, but uh, you know, here's this guy doing it. Um, anyways, convections. Uh, basically, if you see down here in the picture, uh, you have kind of a heating element underwater. And what happens is when the water heats up, it expands. And becomes less dense therefore it's buoyant um, compared to the rest of the colder water around it and it floats to the top and in a, in a pan right here boiling um, a uh, a pan of boiling water right by the burners the water is expanding rising to the top and the cooler water on top is rushing in to replace the the water that left uh, to go to float to the top so that's how that's why you get rolling uh, rolling boils uh, boiling water with macaroni you can kind of see the macaroni swirl around and everything uh, this happens uh, um, basically with the air too uh, that's why um, usually in the afternoon 
um, here in Southern California, uh, the the desert gets a lot hotter than the inland, or even in the inland inland valleys, gets a lot hotter than the beach because the the uh, the water of the ocean is kind of like a, a temperature moderator. It's really hard to heat up water, so the beach area ends up being cool. Uh, and the deserts get hot and the air rises in the desert. So this cold air for, um, by the beach ends up rushing in to replace uh, the rising hot air in the desert. So you get this uh, afternoon sea breeze that comes in. Um, and also, um, you know, when air, when an air parcel of air expands, it cools off. Um, so basically if... Uh, as you, uh, I mean, that's kind of not what's really going on here in this example. She's, you've got a pot, a pressure cooker with steam coming out. The reason why, um, the the reason why that you have uh, the steam cooling off is basically um, condensation. Um, the water uh, particles end up exchanging their their heat with the air and become cooler themselves. And you could just put your hand. If you get it really close, you see this invisible part right here is really hot. That can burn you really bad. That's the actual steam. Uh, people have that misnomer. They think this cloudy stuff here is steam, but the steam is actually the clear here. Steam is pure water vapor. This is actually um, uh, this is actually water droplets, or kind of like a mist that forms. But the steam is uh, water in its gaseous form. Okay, um, here's another question. Although warm air rises, why are mountaintops cold and snow covered while the valleys below are relatively warm and green? And go ahead and pause and think of the best answer. Yeah, basically, um, uh, let's go back to the question. Uh, warm air cools when it's rising. And uh, also because there's a lot more air on on top of us down here in the valleys than there is uh, up in the mountains, so it's easier for the 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 warmth to radiate away back into space. So you know, especially in a meadow valley uh, high in the mountains where you where you have it's kind of enclosed by some hills and the wind is not blowing, those areas can become really cold at night. Okay, and then we talked about this already, uh, how this works. You basically got the desert heating up and uh, uh, expanding and pulling in the cold air. So I won't, uh, I won't belabor this page here. Now radiation, again, uh, it's basically when you have atoms and molecules wiggling, um, they emit a kind of like a electromagnetic wave, a light wave, a radio wave. When something's really hot, like the little filament inside of a light bulb, uh, it emits visible light. If it's uh, just kind of hot um, to the touch or, you know, but it's not glowing, it emits infrared light. And uh, um, the incandescent light bulb actually does emit a lot of infrared light as well. Uh, but the cooler it gets, the more percentage that's going to be in the infrared, which is uh, below the visible spectrum. So frequencies of electromagnetic radiation that are that are beneath that of the visible spectrum. And then we have radio waves here, which are even lower um, than light waves. So you kind of got uh, light, infrared, and then um, you got really short radio waves, which are called microwaves, and then and then rate you know regular broadcast radio, which is lower, and then AM, which is way way down here, and very low into the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, the surface of the Earth loses energy to outer space due to mostly um, radiation. Um, that's uh, oh, I just gave it away. Oh well, um, let's see. And uh, we'll talk, we'll just talk, go ahead and talk about that. Well, let's see. Yeah, basically, um, the, the Earth is not really in conduction, uh, contact with space, so you can't have any conduction. Um, convection, there's, again, there's no gas in space. It's a vacuum, so you can't have this. Radioactivity, nah, that's, uh, I mean, there is radioactivity in the core of the Earth, and that's why the Earth remains molten to this day, but it's radiation is the main way that we lose energy to outer space. So sorry about giving that away. Um, but I'd have to like stop and restart this whole thing and I'm not going to do that. Let's see. Um, 
okay. Uh, which body glows with electromagnetic waves? So uh, go ahead and think uh, what's the best answer. C, both A and B. So both the sun and the earth are emitting um, electromagnetic because the earth is not completely cold. It has some warmth to it. It's going to be radiating back out into space. And the sun is obviously emitting radiation because we can see it as visible light. Okay. Um, radiant energy, it's energy transferred, again, from a hot to cold object. And uh, it's electromagnetic waves. Um, the longer waves are, are radio waves. The shorter ones are x-rays. Um, in the visible region, we have the different uh, frequencies of light. Of red is the sh as the longer waves, and violet, the higher frequency, is the shorter waves. And this is kind of a little illustration. If you wiggle a rope really fast, you can see that the distance from this part of the wave here to this part of the wave is shorter than if you were wiggling it slower. So there you can kind of see the relationship between frequency. That's how fast you're wiggling the rope and what the wave, the length of this wave is here. Okay, and, and as I mentioned before, everything that has some kind of temperature radiates. Um, the sun surface is so hot that you, you get visible light. And uh, because the earth is not as hot as the sun, it emits a lower frequency infrared light. And we can't see that our eyes do not respond to that low of frequency of electromagnetic radiation. Now this uh, here is um, basically, um, uh, it's called Weiss's Law. It's, it's the, the frequency or the peak of the emitted radiation, like where most of the energy, the radiation is emitted, is proportional to the temperature. So if you have something cooler, its peak of uh, frequency is going to be at a lower uh, frequency. So that's why if you have a red hot nail and it's, and it's, or you have a nail and you heat it on the, uh, and if you held it with a pair of pliers and you heat it up on the stove, once it um, barely gets hot enough to start glowing, that color that is going to be very, very um, dull red, like a very deep red color, which is the corresponds to a lower frequency on the visible spectrum. Now, if you're able to have a, a hotter torch or something like that, and you heat it to a higher temperature, it'll glow orange. So that's a higher temperature, it's getting a, a higher frequency, more of an orangey yellow color. And if you got it hotter yet, it would glow um, a yellow color and even hotter if you started putting oxygen on it and it started burning, you'd actually get a white, uh, um, a white fire, like spark, kind of like a sparkler if you've ever seen that. And that's because it's really, really hot. Okay, so... Um, so anything uh, above 500 degrees Celsius, you get some uh, deep red light. 600, you get some yellow light emitted. And about 1500 Celsius, uh, an object emits white light. Okay, so um, also um, you get absorption of radiate, uh, radiant energy. So like if you've ever touched a belt buckle, in a uh, on a hot sunny day, like one of those old uh, old fashioned metal boat buckles in a car, it's it's they really get hot. They can burn you really bad, and uh, that's because uh, metal is a good conductor, but it's actually a poor emitter of of radiation. Um, so the, the when it heats up, it has no way to get rid of the excess temperature that it has. It's it's really slow at getting rid of uh, the temperature. Uh, so the thing ends up slowly heating up to a really high temperature. Um, good absorbers are good emitters. So that's why if you had a lump of charcoal in your car on a hot day, you could pick it up and be just fine. Because uh, something that's dull black color, like a flat black color, is a very good emitter. And it's also a very good absorber. Uh, but because it's such a good emitter, it can't um, build up. Uh, yeah, it can't build up that temperature and it wouldn't burn you. Okay. All right. If a good absorber of radiant energy were a poor emitter, its temperature compared with its surroundings would be, and I'll go ahead and let you pause and answer that, higher. Uh, and that the example I gave was a seatbelt in a hot uh, car on a hot day. 
Uh, pizza placed in the snow would be Annette. Go ahead and fill in the blank. Pause if you need to. Emitter. Because the pizza is hotter than its surroundings, it's going to be uh, losing energy. Which melts faster in sunshine? Dirty snow or clean snow? Dirty snow. Um, basically because the sunlight is going to be ab absorbing into the dirt uh, that's on top of the snow and causing the snow to melt. Okay, reflection of radiant energy. A, a good example would be a mirror. Um, basically, a mirror would take a really long time to get hot in the sunshine because most of the energy is getting reflected back. Okay. And something that doesn't emit a lot or reflect a lot of energy ends up looking very dark. Um, the pupil of your eyes don't reflect very much light. It, the, the eye, the, in your pupil, the light goes in and would just bounce around in your eye and not come out. And this is kind of the same sort of thing. And this would be an ideal absorber would be a, a metal box, uh, like a black box in here with a little hole in it. So this little aperture, this little area right here would be a perfect absorber because there's nothing there to reflect the light. And the light would end up just bouncing around and getting trapped inside this box. So this is ideal, um, ideal, um, basically perfect, perfectly black object. Um, and that's because of the hole in the side. The, the hole is what's the perfect uh, black object, not the, the whole box. Uh, Newton's law of cooling. This is kind of common sense. It's basically saying how fast something cools off, how much heat energy is leaving the object, is proportional to the change in temp uh, the difference in temperature. So you see this delta symbol here. This means temperature 2 minus temperature 1. Uh, temperature 2 um, being the uh, one of the temperatures like the outside or um, cooler or hotter temperature and temperature 1 being the inside or the temperature of the object. So the difference here is like a little subtraction between the two temperatures. If it's greater, the conduction of heat will also be greater. And that, like I said, this total common sense. And this is from Isaac Newton. Okay. Um... So basically, um, it basically states that if you had frozen food, it will warm faster in a warm room than a cold room. Again, uh, that's, that seems to be common sense, and Newton's law confirms that. Okay, it's commonly thought that a can of, uh, of beverage will cool faster in the coldest part of a refrigerator. Uh, knowledge of Newton's law of cooling, go ahead and pick the best answer. Pause it if you need to. A, it supports this knowledge. Basically because delta T would be bigger, the conduction of heat would be bigger. Because remember the proportional, bigger delta T, and then you have more heat conduction. So you double the uh, difference in temperature. So say it goes from instead of 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, which would give you a delta T of 10. Say it went to 10 to 50 degrees Celsius, that would be... Um, uh, a delta T of 40, then the, the heat transferred would be, tra it would be transferring a rate of four times as fast as the, the slower difference. Now we'll talk about greenhouse gas, a little bit of a contentious issue of global warming. Uh, it's kind of a politicized thing, which I, I've, I feel like it's unfortunate it's become so political uh, because it, I just, you know, people should just be looking at the science. Is it true? Is it what's going on? But uh, and when a political party picks it up as a rallying point, then then nobody the other side just doesn't want to listen. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the ba the way that greenhouse gas works, uh, or the greenhouse a greenhouse works, is you have a a transparent house like pla clear plastic where sunlight rays can come in uh, and strike the surfaces inside the greenhouse. And when it strikes it, not all of the light energy is reflected back. And actually a much smaller portion, maybe 20% 20, 20 of that light uh, would be reflected back. And uh, uh, the rest is going to turn into uh, t uh, you know, the warming up the objects that, that are being hit by the light. 
And since that, uh, since the objects are not hot enough to glow, um, it's a much lower frequency infrared radiation. And that, that frequency of light cannot pass through the glass, so it's trapped inside this. And it gets hotter and hotter. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to skip this slide because I pretty much explained that. All right. Um, so with global warming, what's going on, or you know, the greenhouse effect here on Earth is you have light coming in, and uh, say maybe less cloud cover to reflect light back out into space, and it comes in as a short wavelength, heats stuff up, and leaves as a longer wavelength. Now, uh, things that are like greenhouse gases, so to speak. Uh, um, would be water vapor, excess water vapor, or carbon dioxide, end up absorbing this so this can't escape back out into space. It gets scattered. These waves get scattered back to the Earth, and, and slowly things heat up. And then uh, the ice, um, ice caps get smaller. Um, uh, and since ice caps are very light-colored, um, the technical word is albedo. They have a very high albedo. They reflect uh, light back into space. Um, to a high percentage, I think it's about 80 or 90 percent, uh, snow would be reflecting light back into space. And since those are getting smaller, uh, more, uh, you know, less of the light's getting reflected back into space, and the and you get this kind of spiral runaway uh, feedback effect where the ice starts melting faster. There's less ice to reflect the light back into space. Therefore, everything gets even warmer still. So that's kind of what's going on. Um, um, and I talked about this. Okay, the greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming. Go ahead and pick the best answer. They absorb more infrared than visible light. So that's why the light is able to pass through to the surface of the Earth, the visible light. Uh, then it gets absorbed, but then the infrared light gets scattered back to Earth and instead of going back out into space. And solar power, uh, more energy from the sun hits the Earth in one hour than all of the energy that's consumed by humans in the entire year. Just a little factoid anyways. Uh, hopefully you found this informative. And uh, there will be a quiz I'm posted and I'll, I'll send you the information on Canvas.